Kelly Kemper. I live in New York City, uh, where the Statue of Liberty is in the Empire State Building. Um, también hablo español. Viví en México por casi 10 años, hace ya más de 20 años. Eh, pero no voy a contener español porque eh, tengo una falta de vocabulario. Pero quizá más tarde, cuando hacemos preguntas, voy a tentar en español. Um, antes de que comenzamos, uh, I had a question for everyone. Uh, who here is an entrepreneur? And who here is a coder? Anybody write code? Uh, one other question. How, uh, who here is over the age of 25? All right. Um, when I lived in Mexico pre-94, uh, it was pre-NAFTA. Um, this neighborhood didn't exist at all. That was only 20 years ago. Today we've got all these buildings, all this internet pipe, and we actually have internet, something we didn't have 20 years ago. A lot of us here have iPhones and tablets. Um, so one of the things I want to talk about today is thinking big and thinking about change. I see a tendency across a lot of entrepreneurs to think locally and think uh, about solving current problems. But a lot of what being an entrepreneur is, is thinking about the future, solving a problem that doesn't yet exist and thinking about something that may exist in five years. Um, so that's what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about lots of different opportunities. I'm going to talk about myself. Um, I'm going to talk about some companies that we've invested in over the course of the past 10 years. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit on folding, funding alternatives. Although I will say I did delete about five or six slides based on the presentations that I saw for the past two hours. And then we'll have Q&A uh, for anyone who has any questions. Uh, before we start, I wanted to thank the folks at Campus Party, uh, Tommaso for bringing us down here, uh, and for organizing all of this. So about a year ago, the founder of Netscape, uh, Netscape came out in 1993 as the first internet browser, wrote an article in the Wall Street Journal about why software is eating the world. And he has a quote that I live by and I think about, which is, for internet-based companies, the game is only truly beginning now. Um, so the last 15 years have, have been super interesting. Uh, we've seen a lot of great companies, companies like Yahoo come about, uh, GeoCities, early business models that some were proven, some were unproven. But from my vantage point, the next tw 10 to 20 years are going to be more interesting. Um, I put up this slide here because I'm a big fan of kiteboarding. So are a lot of entrepreneurs, the founders of Google, uh, amongst others. And what's interesting about kiteboarding is it's a high-speed sport. You're allowed to fly. So these guys are on flat water and they're using the power of the wind to hurl themselves in the air. The sport's about 10 years old, uh, and each year it gets more and more progressive. People are jumping higher and higher. Unfortunately, none of these is me. I can only jump about this high, but I intend to jump higher someday. But interestingly, uh, as time goes on, about a year ago, uh, someone got to a new high. The highest jump that I had ever seen was about 10 meters, which is pretty high. Last year, a group of Brits decided to jump over this pier, um, probably 30 plus meters, uh, and they landed safely on the other side. So the question for me and the question for you is, how high are they going to be jumping in the next two to three to four or five years? So why be optimistic? Um, Vivek runs Singularity University on the West Coast, uh, which is a university organized for entrepreneurs about thinking big. Most people in the world have been affected by advances in computing and mobile technologies. In a short 15 years, the internet has changed the way we work, shop, communicate and think. Knowledge, which used to be only available to the elite classes through books such as Encyclopedia Britannica, is today abundant and free. Think Wikipedia. All of this happened because computing power is growing exponentially. The technology industry knows this growth as Moore's Law. A 
although we had a tough couple years five years ago, we're getting over it. A lot of people were laid off from their jobs in 2008, 2009, um, and a lot of those people decided to start companies. So we really are in an area of innovation and unprecedented boom. Sometimes call it the, the golden age of innovation. Over the past 10 years, we've seen some interesting stuff. I think we've just seen the beginning of it. Social media and networking is just getting started. The human genome mapping product is really, really just at its earliest stages. The Y generation, net natives, many of you who are under 25, you've never experienced life without an iPhone, without a laptop, without an iPad. Cloud computing, uh, the ability to use Amazon Web Services to launch your business, test your business without having to buy a server. Nanotechnology and broadband. All of these things have come about in the handful of the most recent years and all of this will create an explosion of entrepreneurship over the next 10 years. By 2015, it's estimated that there will be one trillion connected devices. I have no idea what one trillion looks like, but I know it's a lot. Imagine people with pacemakers monitored directly to wireless systems. In the not too distant future, Cars will run on 64-bit multi-core processors and drive themselves, possibly. No more needing a taxi to get lost. The car will do that for you. And the future that IBM believes will be dominated by this concept of a system of systems where software scales to devices on its own. The 2000s saw Google becoming one of the most powerful companies in the world because it helped get a grip on sprawling content. Today, Skype, LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter are all connecting every person on the planet. 10 years ago, Skype was launched, and now connects 300 million people on a monthly basis. Over 2 billion Skype users in total. LinkedIn, also about 10 years, reaches 225 million people. Facebook, a little bit more recent, has 1.1 billion users and is probably the largest and most consuming site on the web. And Twitter, only seven years, seems to be dominating this conference from what I see, reaches 250 million users on a daily basis and constantly breaks news of Osama bin Laden's uh, uh, death or of the uprises in Egypt, completely dismantling the news industry. Picture it. 12 years ago, none of these companies existed. The things that we spend all of our time on today are brand new companies in the scheme of things. So it used to be that when I joined the venture business in 2000, we focused on what was a $50 billion software industry. And that defining that software industry was primarily the US, and it was people like SAP and software that sold to large enterprises. Today, because of companies like this, it's really a global opportunity. We can reach two plus billion people on broadband devices around the world, not just in the United States, but here in Mexico, in Turkey, in France, in China. That's really now a $15 trillion GDP. Again, I started in this business 13 years ago and I invested in what was a $50 billion market and now Across venture as a whole, across innovation, we're talking about $15 trillion in opportunity. It's a massive difference. A lot of you have seen this slide before. The cost to start a company is dirt cheap. Uh, not only has the opportunity for innovation grown dramatically, but the cost to launch a business within this massive opportunity has come close to zero. In 2000, when it was a $50 billion market, it cost $5 million just to build a piece of software, let alone test it or see if it's here. Startup Alley, Wyla, it's all about launching companies. Entrepreneurship is on the rise globally. And the world is getting flatter. 
middle class is exploding, that means more buyers. That means more buyers, more people with devices who can buy your software or buy your wares. Broadband is everywhere. I don't remember the speed of the internet here, but it's off the charts. Um, and the US, in its former dominance, is now home to less than 40% of the top 50 most innovative companies. I can, I can remember a year, maybe 20 years ago, where that was probably 90%. So that means the rest of the world is catching up and building really, really fascinating companies. Broadband access is a tired subject, but it reaching the rest of the world is doing something phenomenal. That plus Wikipedia and education is really allowing for someone outside of the US to be the next Bill Gates or the next Steve Jobs or the next Larry Page or the next Niklas Zenstrom because he didn't come from the US. Skype is a foreign company. Latest success in New York, David Karp, the founder of Tumblr, Tumblr 24, 25 years old, and best known Mark Zuckerberg. Who knows, maybe in five years, could be you. The number of broadband users is growing in almost every single market. So the reason most of those faces up there before were American is because penetration is high in the US. But penetration is getting higher and higher in foreign markets, places like Brazil, Mexico, Russia, India, China. Each of those people that are connected will have access to better education and be able to be the next coders of the world. I touched on this. But the number of devices is growing extremely rapidly. By 2015, there will be nearly 3 billion internet users, over 5 billion cell phones in use, and over 2 billion wireless internet subscribers. That's up from just 20 years ago, 23 years ago, only 100 million PCs. These are all, again, potential customers and potential entrepreneurs. In 2011, for the first time, smartphones exceeded PC shipments. That means there were more of these sold than devices like this, which means that the rest of the developing world, more than half of the 7 billion people on this planet, now have access to the same stuff that everyone here has access to. All right, let's recap. The last wave of innovation, personal computing, had a fraction of the addressable market. 30 million PCs were sold globally in 1992, 20 years ago. Today, that's about 400 million units, 13-fold, and it's about a billion units sold annually of smartphones. About me really quickly, so you see why I'm excited. I was born in Brazil in a town called Campinas. Campinas is uh, right outside of Sao Paulo. It's just very similar to Toluca, about an hour away from the center of town. It's an industrial town. Um, uh, my parents are French uh, and moved, my grandparents are French and moved to Brazil in the 30s. And my father spent his career working at Robert Bosch, which was in Campinas and also in Toluca. I left Brazil when I was pretty young and I moved to Mexico. My father worked in Toluca and commuted up this highway every single day to work. Me dice Chilango. ¿Quién se acuerda de esta licencia? Eso. It doesn't work anymore, unfortunately. Um, y gané un poquito de peso. I was here until I was 18. Um, and during the years I was here, I discovered the internet. I went to school with a guy who's now a hacker at Google. And uh, with one of these really old PCs, we hacked into the University of Texas Austin system. I don't exactly know what for, but we screwed around, we played with people's grades, and they could never trace us back because we were in Mexico. What were they gonna do to us? This guy is now in charge of security at Google, so he's done well. 
finishing high school, I went to Northwestern University and I studied industrial engineering. I taught myself to code. Netscape had just been released. That's version two or so, I believe. So I basically downloaded a bunch of HTML scripts and figured out how to make really, really ugly web pages. With that, I was hired my sophomore year into a really hot company in New York called Avalanche Systems. Avalanche was one of the first and top web design shops. Alongside agency.com, site specific, modem media, and organic media. There really weren't that many people in 1996 who, believe it or not, could write things as simple as HTML and Perl. Things today which are pretty much auto generated. Um, so these shops would charge $500,000 for a simple web page, and people were paying that in droves. One of those clients that I worked on was the very first website from Mana, which was very cool. I was the only guy in our little software shop who even knew who Mana was. And so when the client, Warner Music, offered to take us to the concert at Radio City Music Hall, they gave us 15 tickets. The only person in the company who took those 15 tickets was me. So I took 14 of my good friends who did not work with us to an awesome concert, went backstage, and partied with these guys. What was fascinating about those days is we had to pay attention to web page size. So we couldn't put up a website or a page of a website, a single HTML file that was more than 50 kilobits in size. 50 kilobits. The last time I even saw a 50 kilobit file, I can't remember. This PowerPoint I'm using is 50 megabits. 50 kilobits is nothing. A challenge for anyone here, build a really fancy website that's only 50 kilobits in size. I was a 15th employee at Avalanche. I left after six months. There were 80 employees. I was one of two C programmers there. Two years later, Avalanche became a company called Razorfish and grew to, I believe, something like 15,000 employees, went public, $5 billion market cap, and the story went on. I went back to college. I started my own development shop, charging people an arm and a leg to build web pages because I knew how to do it. I spent some time at Ameritech. Ameritech is the Telmex of the Midwest of Chicago. I worked on things like five ESS switches, which were these giant monstrous machines that helped move calls around. And then they ended up at Ford Motor Company, the best and worst job of my life. If you have any interest, we can talk about it separately. And then I found my way to a group called Darby Technology Ventures. Darby Technology Ventures was started by a guy named Nicholas Brady, who was the former Secretary of Treasury 25 years ago, he helped issue the Brady Bonds, which pulled Latin America out of a near disaster. Uh, he used that reputation to launch this fund, and we launched a, uh, this fund and a series of funds. And myself and three folks launched a $30 million fund based in Washington, D.C., that invested in about a dozen companies in Latin America. We wrote $1 to $2 million checks from 2000 to 2003 in companies in Argentina, Brazil, Mexico, and Costa Rica. These are a handful that I was involved with. Innova was the very first uh, company and developed PKI 20 years ago. And PKI had real, no real application in the US. Uh, but in Brazil, given the legal construct, being able to authenticate and quote unquote digitally notarize every transaction uh, from an email exchange, from a legal document, to swiping your bus card on the bus, CertiSign Powers, a massive company now that dominates the Brazilian market. And the last company, Jackby, is a company that came out of Monterrey um, that built a set of Java applets and tools for the enterprise mashup business. Uh, before Ruby existed, uh, people had to go find libraries, and these guys provided libraries. This company was started by a phenomenal entrepreneur named Luis de Rechin who took the front office of the company, moved it to the US, signed partnerships and deals with folks like Forbes and others, and left back office in Monterrey. The company is still doing well and has raised over $20 million in the past 10 years. I eventually got called away from Washington DC and uh, with a chance to move to New York with a much bigger fund. I joined this fund called Steel Point Capital Partners, which was about a $300 million fund. 
We managed about 40 investments while I was there. Uh, these are a variety, some of the logos that we dealt with. Um, most of these companies up here are generating sales of anywhere from 10 to $300 million. Some of them are now public. Um, uh, some are doing better than others. To highlight a few, uh, although the fund was primarily domestic focused, in large part because consumer and retail is very much a local business, at least was historically, as was media and marketing. Two of the companies that we found globally were first Workshare, which is a company that came out of the UK uh, and built a really cool software product that 99% of the world's law firms use. So if you send a legal document to a lawyer and they send you back a marked up copy of that legal document, that is a Workshare software product. It was, a group, it was a company that came out of the UK, had a hard time finding capital in the UK. Most of the large law firms are based in the US. So with our capital, they relocated to the US and built a big business. The other company is a company called Atempo, which came out of France. Tempo is a storage software business that had dominated 100% of the French market, but the French market's really small, 50 million people. So they wanted to move to the US and tackle the market in the US. They moved to Palo Alto and became the largest provider of backup and storage software systems for the Apple and Peace Apple market, which, as everyone knows here, has boomed in the past five, six years. There's also some of the other consumer products that are kind of fun and global. I believe Naked Juice is a global business. Tasty Delight is a low-calorie low ice cream business that's now expanded outside of the U.S. Um, and Kid Robot, uh, if anybody knows Paul Frank, Kid Robot's a similar brand to that, kind of urban, and if uh, they have some distribution in Asia. While at Steel Point, I launched something called NYCVC, which is the Association of Venture Investors in New York, representing about 125 different VC investors with offices in New York. I left Steel Point in 2009 and started work on two of my own funds, Entrepreneurs Roundtable Accelerator and Revel Partners. I'm going to start with Revel since it's probably less relevant. Revel is a growth expansion stage venture fund focused on companies in ad tech. Ad tech is a 30 to $70 billion market, which is the plumbing of how that ad gets from an advertiser's dollars to that display ad on your computer screen or that video ad on your com computer screen. All those things that nobody pays attention to but it's the way a lot of websites are currently monetized today. We typically invest one to two million dollars in companies. Most of these companies are generating at least a hundred thousand dollars a month in revenues. So Revel is not a seed stage fund. We look for established companies that are in business and have clients. A few of these to highlight. Trax is a company that came out of Tel Aviv, Israel. Uh, really interesting social technology. They are now the leader in social intelligence, which is in the business intelligence category, pulling in social data. We invested in this company and helped them relocate their headquarters from Tel Aviv to New York, where most of their customers are based, but they left R&D in Tel Aviv, where some of the greatest engineering minds are based. The others are more domestic firms. SmartClip was actually the largest video network in Europe and had a small presence in the US. We helped them move into the US and then we eventually sold the company to a company called Adconian last year. So Entrepreneurs Roundtable Accelerator. How many people here know of 500 startups? Carlos was here presenting yesterday, I believe. Or Cesar was here presenting, presenting yesterday. Uh, Entrepreneurs Roundtable is an accelerator similar to 500 startups based in New York City only. We invest in 10 companies twice per year, once in January and once in June. Each of these 10 companies get a $40,000 investment. They get free office space in New York City. They get free legal services. They get free bookkeeping services. They get free accounting services. And they get free help from myself and two partners, as well as 10 retired tech CEOs who help them on a daily basis for those four months. We've invested in 50 companies over the past two years. I'm not gonna walk through all of them because that would be really boring, but I wanna highlight a few. Pricing Engine 
is a business intelligence service for digital marketers. They have customers all over the world. Public stuff sells a, a 311 software solution to cities and municipalities. So in New York City, we have something called 911, which is what you call when you have an emergency. You're getting robbed or someone's dying. 311 was the alternative for calling. Happy Couple launched in the App Store, and they instantly went global. This is what I'm talking about, global opportunity. This was a three-person company when this happened. They had paying customers, paying them anywhere from $30 to $200 in over 66 countries. Their largest market was Australia. These founders had never been to Australia. They had no idea what was Australia was all about. Yet, that's where most of their customers came from. This is an old slide. Their growth has now doubled or tripled. Stray Boots, a similar story. Three Americans from Princeton. They built an international business providing gaming solutions. So, um, uh, as a way to travel and visit a new town, you can open up a Time Out magazine and they can give you places to go eat, places to go visit. Stray Boots is an interactive platform to go visit towns and discover new places. They can build cities remotely, populate content in the app, and people pay them $10 to be able to use this app to go explore a city. And the app is interactive, so it's kind of like a, a, a trivia to go discover a new neighborhood. We just three.